Hi there, let's go over our inspection addendum and the timelines that it puts in place for the contract. So the inspection addendum is actually going away. So at some point in the future, we're not going to have the inspection addendum and they're going to put the inspection process back into the body of the purchase agreement. Now, that might make you think, why is she even teaching this then? Because change is slow. So even though I know that's coming, I still would rather go ahead and train you on what we're currently using day in and day out, even if that means uh, this will become obsolete in the future. So what we have here is an addendum to the contract. And as a quick little side note to make you smarter than other realtors, addendums are used before your contract is ratified. Amendments are used after your contract is ratified. So the easiest way to remember that is that addendum comes before amendment in the alphabet. So addendum comes before amendment in the process. So you would use an addendum to add something to an offer. You, but once a contract is ratified and fully executed, you cannot change the contract. You can amend the contract. You cannot change the constitution, but you can amend the constitution with amendments. So those are the two ways to try to remember the difference between addendum and amendment. Back in the day, um, RVAR had two forms. They had an addendum and an amendment, which were blank for you to add or amend contracts as needed. And then eventually they realized, it, it, we're just gonna make that one form and we're gonna have a checkbox for, is this an addendum or is this an amendment? Still, I see those checkboxes wrong or people just completely ignore them because they don't know which one it is. So addendum is prior to execution, amendment is after execution. You cannot go back to the body of the contract once it's executed and mark it up and change things and have everybody initial it. That's, it's executed. You can't go back in like that. What you can do is clarify or change things with an amendment. You're going to amend the contract, okay? You're now smarter than 50% of the agents in town. So um, what we're gonna do today is an inspection addendum. This is being added to an offer. So we are not using this form after contract ratification. We're using this form as we create and craft our offer. We're going to check the box on page one of our purchase agreement under addenda to indicate that we are including the inspection addendum. That section on the purchase agreement is where you have to indicate everything that's going to be attached to that offer. If you're putting the MLS input sheet or the MLS printout with your offer, but you've not checked a blank box on page one of the purchase agreement and said MLS sheet, you have not actually made that MLS input sheet or that MLS printout part of the contract. You have to check that box. If you submit the inspection addendum with your offer package, but you don't check the box on page one, that one of the addenda is the inspection addendum, it will not, it will not attach itself to your offer. You may be sending it, but it's not going to be a valid uh, document. It's not going to be binding on the parties. So you've got to make sure you indicate on page one. So Let's learn it as it is now, knowing that I'll be teaching this again, hopefully in a few months, when the inspection language is moved back over onto the body of the contract. So the beginning part of the inspection addendum is identifying what contract this is going with. So we're going to have the parties, we're going to have the address, and then we're going to have the very first paragraph that everybody skips over, and we're going to go into detail on that. So the top paragraph is the description of the parties and the location. The second paragraph is really the meat and potatoes of everybody's obligations until we get to page two. So what it says is that the contract obligates the parties of the contract to do the below, make the contract contingent upon the below indicated inspections. Now, some important parts in there is the fill in the blank is how many business days the buyer 
is going to have to complete all of their inspections, okay? I put 10 business days in there. I may put more if there's some sort of contingency, like a subject to suitable housing contingency where the seller's got to have two weeks to go find a house. I may then make that a 30 business day or a 20 business day inspection period because I want to have my inspections after the seller has found their suitable housing, okay? So it really needs to be customized to your offer. If there's something special about your offer, like the seller wants two weeks to go find a house to move into or the contract can be terminated, I don't want my buyers to go to the expense of inspections if they're only going to get kicked out of the contract two weeks later. OK, so if there's anything unique or special like that, call us. We're happy to help make a recommendation here for you. But on a regular offer where the seller says, sure, we'll just move and we're going to have a 30 day closing, I'm going to put 10 business days in there. Those days begin counting after full execution of the contract by all parties. So what we call our ratification date on the contract, that is where we begin counting business days. Now, the standard provisions page of our purchase agreement indicates that the business days begin counting the day after the act that triggers it. So that would mean if we ratify the contract and everybody has signed it, it's been returned on November 14th, business day one is November 15th because it's going to be the immediate business day following. Nobody pull up the calendar and tell me November 15th is a Saturday because it's going to be business days. Um, I was just pulling a date out of the air there. So business days are going to be defined as weekdays in which the majority of the banks in the Roanoke Valley are open for business. That's how we know uh, a Monday. Oh, yay. It is a Monday. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. So that's how we know if the majority of the banks in town are closed for Labor Day, Labor Day will not be counted as a business day. That will be a holiday, okay? Um, I would offer up this piece of best business practice, just work conservatively. If you know you got a Labor Day in there, maybe just wrap up everything by business day nine, just so that there are no arguments later about, well, 12 of the 24 major major banks in town were closed. What does that mean? You know, so I just work conservatively. I may shave off a business day on my end just so that I know we got everything in on time or ahead of schedule. But I'm going to put in 10 business days. Then in underlined text on there, it says that if the purchaser's initial inspections reveal the need for a subsequent or follow-up inspection, then and that would be through like an HVAC company or an actual roofer or a structural engineer or a contractor to come out. So if they come out there and the HVAC is not functioning properly during the home inspection, the home inspector needs to write up that they would recommend an HVAC specialist take a look at the HVAC system. That would be qualified as a subsequent inspection. And what it says is that the purchaser can notify the seller in writing that they would like to have a subsequent inspection. And then they are allowed a seven business day extension to this inspection timeline. Now, the importance of this is that it has to be in writing. So I, as the buyer's agent, have to email the listing agent and say, hey, completed the home inspection today. Unfortunately, the HVAC system was not working properly. So I am going ahead and formally requesting a seven business day extension to our inspection timeline. And then my best business practice is I'm going to go ahead and tell them what that date will be. I'm going to go ahead and count it out twice on the calendar and make sure I know when my final deadline day is. I'm going to include it in that formal request for a inspection extension. Why? Because I would rather set everybody's expectations now than try to fight on the other end that I'm right, okay? Do I feel like I can win on the other end? Sure. But do I want to go through that fight? Absolutely not. I would rather go one further step as a best business practice and just go ahead and lay out what my expectations are. You know, hi, Phil, just giving you a formal request that due to the HVAC not performing properly today during the home inspection, 
we are formally asking for our uh, seven day, seven business day extension to our inspection timeline. By my calculations, that would have our final inspection deadline date of November 22nd, okay? If you do your calculations and come up with something different, please let me know in the next day or two. So now my best business practices, I've told them when our final inspection deadline day is, and please make sure you have calculated that correctly. Get on that calendar, count it out a couple of times, skip over Saturday and Sunday, it's business days. Um, but what I'm doing there is I'm making sure I have had clear communication and set all of the expectations as to what's going to happen. Okay. Now, then it goes on to say what the seller's obligations and timelines are going to be. So it says that any inspections that the seller is burdened to conduct will compl be completed no later than 10 business days prior to settlement. Now, keep in mind that is a moving target because they're still in compliance if the closing date gets bumped out an extra week. That's gonna move their 10 business days prior to settlement, right? So that is going to be the inflow and infiltration inspection through the Western Virginia Water Authority. If the home has public sewer through the Western Virginia Water Authority, that is always going to be a seller obligation. If it has not been done within the past five years, because those Western Virginia Water Authority inflow and infiltration inspections are good for five years. You just have to then reach out to the Western Virginia Water Authority and say, hey, can I get an updated letter? and they'll send you an updated letter, okay? Um, sometimes it's well, septic, termite. There are other inspections that could be burdened onto the seller. None of those have to be completed by the seller until 10 days, 10 business days prior to settlement. The thought process on that is, why are we gonna make the seller pay for inspections and conduct inspections if it falls apart after the home inspection or the appraisal. So they're trying to bump the seller obligated inspections to the end of the transaction period. Well, that creates its own host of problems. Let's say by the time the seller does the well septic and termite inspection, we've already negotiated the repair request on the ROC. The seller's already decided to pay the remediation limit. Well, where do we go now, now that we found out they're termites? So it can create a new, a new host of problems. So have the conversation when you are the listing agent with your seller about, hey, when do you want to get these done? Let's hold off until maybe we get through the home inspection process, but maybe let's not wait until the appraisal's done because sometimes the appraisal's coming in, you know, two, three days prior to closing. And then you're going to try to hustle and get a well septic and termite inspection done, you're probably going to end up delaying closing. Now, that's perfectly fine because the seller can do that. I just wouldn't say it's going to make you many friends. So I would say that's a conversation you should be having with your seller about timing. So after we get past that section in paragraph two, where it talks about how the seller has no later than 10 business days prior to settlement to conduct their inspections. It goes on to say that if the purchaser fails to do their inspections prior to the inspection deadline, then the purchaser is forfeiting their right to conduct the inspections. Too bad. You should not have waited longer than your inspection deadline to try to conduct your inspections. Now, keep in mind, if it's that you cannot get a home inspector out there because they're booked up, you can talk to the listing agent about that and say, hey, listen, the home inspector's out of town for a week. I've called around. I cannot find another home inspector. Could we please talk to our parties about filing an extension for our inspection deadline? And I have certainly done that before. So it's just about making sure you're on top of it. I wouldn't say a seller is gonna have a problem unless you have a very difficult seller with okaying a three business day extension. Independent of that seven business day extension after you've had the results of the inspections come back, this is just extending the inspection deadline. All parties can agree to that. And that's gonna give you three more business days to try to get a home inspector out there, okay? Please try to do things up front. 
please don't wait to business day seven to say, oops, I should probably call some home inspectors and try to get one out there, okay? Be proactive. Like the, the, the majority of problems that I have to enter into and try to help people extract themselves from generally come from miscommunication, lackluster communication, or just dropping the balls. And it happens, it absolutely happens. I am guilty of realizing I have not gotten a termite inspection done and we are closing two days later as a listing agent. I have had to make that phone call to say, well, oops, I've got to maybe beg for y'all to give us a couple more days. It may push closing. Um, I got to call in some favors and try to get a termite inspector out there. It happens, I understand it happens. Try to stick with your processes. Try to work with um, checkoff lists. You know, uh, Jennifer, Donna, and I all have some sort of chart hanging on our wall where we're keeping track of the progress of our transactions. Jess has been kind enough to make me one on an app where I can now have it at a glance from my phone if I want to look at it on my phone. Um, plus, it's way prettier than the one on my wall. But the one on my wall gets it done, y'all. So it's just about having the processes in place and make sure you're not letting anything slip through the cracks. So we go further down that paragraph and it goes on to say that if the seller fails to conduct their inspections within the time period in the addendum, the purchaser can have the inspections conducted and charge the seller. So if the seller says, yeah, I don't wanna do that termite inspection, the purchaser has the right to go ahead and order it and they can bill it to the seller. Now, if, you're, if the seller is acting that way, you got bigger fish to fry because they may not even be coming to closing, okay? That should be a red flag to you. But sometimes it's innocent. It's, I'm so sorry, this is the listing agent, I'm so sorry, my seller has been hospitalized. I, I really can't call them. Uh, I don't feel like it's appropriate for me to schedule that termite inspection and spend their money for them. And then the timeline expires or, I mean, but in that case, I'm not so sure you're even going to closing on time. So um, it's rare that the seller just refuses to do their inspections. I rarely, rarely see that problem crop up. But if it does, the purchaser can have the inspection done and the purchaser can charge the seller. I will caution you, do not do that as the buyer's agent unless you call me first. Because we have had a, a different situation where the seller fully had intentions of doing it. The buyer's agent decided to go ahead and do it for them. No, that's not okay. And as the buyer's agent, if you're scheduling seller inspections, you should not be doing that. Call me before you ever schedule inspections for the other side of the transaction. There should never be an occasion in your career to have to do that. This is the one weird caveat that if the seller refuses to do it, the buyer's allowed to, but I still want you to call me first. It's that rare that that would happen, okay? Unfortunately, we have had it happen where over-exuberant buyer's agents decide to just take care of that termite inspection for the seller. Well, that's going to create some friction between the buyer's agent and the listing agent. And you may find that the listing agent says, uh, absolutely not. We are not paying you for that. You had no right to go order that on behalf of our buyer. And Jennifer is smiling because she knows this has happened. It absolutely has happened. Um, and it is awkward. Okay. So the last sentence in that paragraph is important. It states that the purchaser agrees to repair any damage caused as a result of the actions of the purchaser or it's engineers, contractors, inspectors on the property. I don't like this clause because my buyer can't control that termite inspector who's shoving his screwdriver through every piece of soft wood in the house, okay? As, a, as the agent, I am telling my termite inspectors, hey, go easy there. Like, please, please don't tear up the floor. Please, I mean, I, I get that you wanna illustrate that there are termites in this piece of wood, one poke does that, thank you very much. We do not need to pry off, you know, um, four square inches of, of rotted wood to prove that there's termites there. Because my purchaser may not end up buying this house, right? We may not come to terms after the result of the inspections. So now the, the termite inspector has damaged the property and my purchaser has signed this form saying they will be responsible for that. 
Well, you can't repair termite riddled wood. So it's going to require my potentially my buyer to replace that piece of wood. And then we get into, are you replacing a piece of wood that has termites? And does the termite treatment have to happen? Um, so I would just say, watch the home inspector, the termite inspector, all of the inspectors and just say, hey, go easy, please. You know, let's not, let's not illustrate too hard that there are some defects in this house because your purchaser is signing this stating that they'll be responsible. I get why it's in there. The seller should not be responsible if one of the inspectors accidentally knocks out a window, right? Or breaks a window. Um, that shouldn't be burdened onto the seller if they can't get the inspector to fix it, okay? Um, but I don't particularly like it because I think it can create problems for the purchaser. The purchaser is saying, sure, I'll be responsible for a third party's actions on this property. But it's there, so you should be aware that it's there. Then we go through each of the inspections and is this contract or is this not, is this contract not contingent upon these inspections? So we have home inspection that is by default a buyer purchased inspection. We have radon inspection. It is also by default a buyer paid inspection. Then we have well, septic and wood infestation inspection. Those could be either seller or buyer. You're gonna indicate. My recommendation is that I'm going to have my buyer do all of the inspections. I'm going to have my buyer pay for all of them. I'm going to have my buyer schedule all of them and have my buyer be in charge of all of them. Because then my buyer is using the vendor of our choosing and we can attend all of those inspections. And we can make sure our buyer is educated on the home they're about to purchase. It also means that if we have a well inspection and we close on the house, and when we close on the house, the well conks out or the well water is not potable, we can go back to the well inspector as the purchaser of the inspection, not, hey, I know the seller paid you to come out and do an inspection, and I am not actually even a party to y'all's contract of hiring you to do the well inspection. I'd like for you to come fix this water situation. You weren't their customer. The buyer was not their customer. So I want my buyer to be the customer to all of these vendors who are providing inspections for the property. I understand that, that may not be possible sometimes. Then we want to burden the cost of those inspections on the seller. But as a best business practice, it's important for the buyer to purchase all of those inspections because they are now the customer to those vendors, even after closing. Does that make sense? Great. So a couple of things I want to point out. The septic inspection is just to make sure the water is drinkable. It has nothing to do with the actual structure of the septic system. This is not indicating um, that you're going to be digging up the septic tank and making sure it has not collapsed. It's not indicating that you're going to have the ability to dig up and make sure the, the lid is on correctly, that the drain field is functioning properly. It's going to be dye down, down the septic system, and they're going to walk over the drain field and make sure that there's no dye seeping up through the ground. Okay. That is all that's happening. Jennifer quite brilliantly decided years ago to start building an extra contingency that the seller is responsible for locating the septic system and having it marked. And she did that in the nick of time for her own son to buy his house. And it turns out that septic tank was like six feet, the drain field and the septic tank and everything was like six feet lower. They had backfilled six feet of backfill over that whole system. So it would have been very, well, it was very difficult for the seller to locate it and find it. And it went, they went to some great expense to do that. And they tried to get out of it about 90 times. And Jennifer kept saying, so sorry, but we'll just wait until you find it. Uh, because that would have been at her son's expense once he moved into the property. So that is an additional septic requirement she is building into the contract because this septic clause wouldn't have gotten that. That would not have required the seller to locate it or do anything other than run dye through the system and then walk over the ground to see if any dye is leaching out of the ground. Okay. 
Um, same with well. Uh, that is that that is testing the water and making sure the water is okay. I have a client who did that and had that inspection done, and they thought they had a spring at the bottom part of their yard. Turns out their well had had a leak in the actual pipes, and we didn't know. So she was irritated when she found out we had a well inspection that did not include checking out the well equipment and that the home inspectors don't check out the well equipment. They're not out there looking at the well equipment. So that may be an additional inspection I may want to write in from now on that I'm going to have a I'm going to have an actual well person come out and inspect the mechanics of the well. That would have caught this leak that had been saturating their ground forever and potentially draining their well. So just know that each of these clauses are testing for a specific thing. Um, and, and, and in my mind, a lackluster test at best when it comes to well and septic. Now termites pretty thorough. It's not just termite. They're looking for wood destroying insects uh, so that can be powder post beetles, that can be carpenter bees, that can be anything that's destroying the wood on the house. All right. Page two goes on to indicate the inflow and infiltration inspection. We've already talked about that one. That is always a seller inspection. It is a free inspection. And that is only required if there is sewer system with Western Virginia Water Authority. It is an inspection to make sure that gutter downspouts and sump pumps are not going into the sewer line. Now, your seller, the seller could have Western Virginia Water Authority for water, but have a septic system, and the inflow and infiltration inspection would not be required because it is about gutter water and and sump pump water going into the sewer system that the Western Virginia Water Authority has to clean. And they would rather that water go out into the yard and go right back down into the water table. Okay. And then G talks about additional structures or systems to be inspected. This is where you're writing the in-ground pool. This is where you're writing the detached garage, the shed, if you wish. This is where you're going to be indicating um, the barn, if you're going to include that. Okay. Anything that is not part of the primary dwelling. You have to indicate it here. I indicate running a camera down the sewer lines in this section. I could make the argument that the sewer line is attached to the primary dwelling and therefore is included in the primary dwelling. I don't wanna make that argument. I wanna go ahead and just write in camera line through the sewer to the street. This is where I'm gonna have an overabundance of communication. I'm gonna set the expectation that I'm going to be conducting that inspection at the buyer's expense. Instead of arguing later and having to get the brokers involved about why we wanna do a camera line inspection, I'm gonna go ahead and just write it in there, okay? That's where, yes, I can win the fight, but I would rather just not even have a fight. So I'm gonna detail it. It's also why I put all the personal property in the purchase agreement again, and I listed all in there. Yes, the standard language probably covers me for 50% of those items, but I'm just going to spell it out anyway, because for me, it's about setting expectations so that I don't have to argue anything later. So section G states that you can have additional structures or systems to be inspected, and this is where you might write in that you're going to have the well equipment inspected or the septic tank inspected. But if you look at that clause, it states that those will be burdened onto the purchaser at the purchaser's expense. This is not something that the seller would have to pay for, okay? And then after we get past that, it talks about the results of inspections. You're going to have three business days as the buyer's agent and the listing agent to deliver inspections to the other party after you receive the report. That's each and every report. That is not after all inspections are completed. It's after the completion of each inspection. So if I get the home inspection report on a Tuesday, but I don't get the radon inspection report until Thursday, I have until, I have until Friday to deliver that home inspection report, but I may have until Monday or Tuesday to deliver that radon inspection report. 
I don't have till Monday or Tuesday to deliver the home inspection report. It's three business days after being delivered the report, each and every report. It used to be done a different way and it tripped up some agents when we transitioned to this. We're not stockpiling all the reports and then delivering them at one time. You have three business days after receipt of the report to get that report to the other side of the transaction, okay? Now, if I'm playing devil's advocate here, it doesn't say what happens if you don't. So you're gonna have an argument, so please do it. But if you don't do it, I get these panicked phone calls from agents who are like, oh my gosh, Ashley, I forgot to send it. And I was one day late sending it. Well, I'm quick to tell them, it doesn't say what's gonna happen if you don't. There is no, this is just a, if you do this, there is no, then that will happen, right? So um, usually it works out fine. The listing agent usually thinks they've got some sort of power up over you as the buyer's agent, but there really are no repercussions. It does not forfeit the buyer's rights to anything. So do it because we're supposed to do it, um, but don't have a panic attack if you send something in late, okay? Now, then it gets complicated because it breaks down to one and two for uh, repair requests. And that's because it puts radon, well, septic, wood infestation, and infl infiltration inspection reports into its own paragraph where it says that the seller is going to complete, correct all defects according to paragraph 17, which is the repair remediation limit section where we talk about what the seller's obligations are. Gotta grab my reading glasses, y'all. And it talks about how those corrections and repairs are gonna be done by a licensed Virginia contractor, licensed pest control company, or certified radon mitigator, unless agreed upon in writing by all parties. So this is where you can agree, both seller and buyer, to use a handyman. You can't agree to that, but both parties have to agree. It can't be the seller saying, well, I'm using a handyman. The buyer would have to say okay to that, and you'd have to agree in writing. And there may be a few items on the removal of contingency form, which is our repair request that you may give the seller permission to do. So you may say, listen, the, the, there's a leak at the kitchen sink, but we're cool if the seller wants to go ahead and correct that themselves. It just has to be agreed upon in writing by all parties. Then section two talks about home inspection and additional inspections, okay? So what that one says is that, and you're gonna fill in the blanks here, I usually, just so you know, I put three business days in the top blank, which is the time in which the purchaser will give the seller the removal of contingency form detailing what the buyer would like the corrections to be. I'm going to put three business days there. Within three business days, I expect the buyer's agent to deliver the removal of contingency form detailing what repairs they're requesting but I'm gonna put five or seven business days in that next blank because that is how many business days the seller has after receipt of the removal of contingency form to indicate what their plans are. How, are they, how is the seller gonna to respond to that repair request? And the reason why I put more days there because I see all of them come across like three days, three days. Three business days is not enough time for the seller to get estimates for all of the repair work. They may have to have an electrician, a plumber, a handyman and a contractor come out to the house and give estimates. Three business days is just not adequate time, especially in this market where it's very hard to get anybody out anyway because everybody's booked up so much. So what I'm seeing happen is we're running out of time for the seller response time. And we're either having to have the seller make a judgment call and say, uh, okay, I guess I'll do everything. And then it turns out it's more costly than the seller thought it was going to be. That's not great. Or the seller's having to say, well, I don't know what it's going to cost. So I guess I'll just issue a credit of the repair remediation limit. Well, as a listing agent, I am never going to give a response of I'll just credit you the repair remediation limit in lieu of repairs without putting an estimate with that. As the listing agent, if my seller wants to credit the repair remediation limit in lieu of repairs, it will always have an estimate from the contractor with it. 
Because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, buyer, we don't know how much it's going to cost. So we're just going to give you the credit. Buyer, you don't know how much it costs either. So we're asking you to gamble that that repair remediation limit is going to be enough to cover it. Maybe it's very obvious because it's just two, two items. And maybe my seller just doesn't feel like having a contractor come out. But in most cases, it's a fairly hefty list. And you're asking as the listing agent, the buyer and the buyer's agent to try to determine how much and if that repair remediation limit is going to be enough to cover it. So as a best business practice, as the listing agent, when my seller and I put a response together, I'm going to make sure there's an estimate with it. That's going to give the buyer a comfort level that the repair remediation amount we are crediting them is enough to cover the repairs. Does that make sense to everybody? This is how you can keep transactions alive by making the choices lower risk to both parties. So this paragraph goes on to say, oh, and as a side note, if you're the listing agent and you're receiving this offer and they have put three business days in there for seller response time, that can be a counter offer item. You can cross that out and make that seven business days and explain to the buyer's agent why your seller needs more days to respond to the repair request. If you can explain it to that buyer's agent, I, I don't see why they would be um, argumentative about keeping that as a short period of time. It's for the best interest of all parties that the seller has time to do their homework. So after that point, further down in that paragraph, it obviously talks about how the seller is bound by clause 17 in the purchase agreement, which is the repair remediation, excuse me, the sellers and purchasers obligations paragraph where we indicate the repair remediation limit. That is where you go to look to figure out what the seller's options are once they receive the removal of contingency form that details the repairs. And it goes further on to say that if the seller does not respond to the removal of contingency form, which is specifying the defects and repairs, then the purchaser has the right to either terminate the contract within two business days of the expiration of the response time, or they may accept the repair remediation credit that was indicated in paragraph 17 and accept the property and as his condition and close. So if the seller response time expires and you have not, as the buyer's agent, you've not heard boo from the listing agent about what they're going to do. Your buyer only has two business days to terminate. So if there was a 15 item repair request on the removal of contingency form that you and your buyer crafted and sent over to the listing agent and this seller response time has expired, and you're calling and you can't get an answer or the listing agent saying, I know I, I can't get the seller to meet with me. Careful there because your buyer only has two business days to terminate. And if they don't terminate within two business days, they are accepting that repair remediation credit from clause 17 and they're moving to closing. And it may have been 15 items and $1,000 isn't going to cut it. But that's the choice you're making for your buyer by not correctly making sure they, that your buyer understands their options and that they have an option to terminate. And if they do opt to terminate, the buyer is refunded the earnest money deposit. Okay, y'all, this is some thick, thick stuff. And also keep in mind, it's going to change here before long. So I am going to open it up to questions, but mostly I just want to normalize for you it's okay to call me when you're weeding through this. It's okay to call me and say, hey, Ashley, my seller doesn't want to get estimates. They just want to credit the repair remediation limit. Am I allowed to call a contractor in to give us some estimates if the seller says that's okay? Yes, you are. Ask the contractors first if there will be a service call fee. Don't be surprised if a contractor comes out, works up an estimate for you, and then hands you a $150 bill for a service call fee, okay? These are questions you should be asking. These are questions you should have your seller ask. I really ideally want the seller making those phone calls and asking those contractors to come out and give estimates, but make sure your seller is reminded 
please make sure you're asking the contractor if there will be a service call fee to come out and make this estimate, okay? And I get it. Contractors are tired of coming out spending an hour getting an estimate ready only for the buyer and the seller to use that as a negotiating tool to try to get some repair remediation credits. And then the contractor doesn't even get any work out of it. That's gotta be super frustrating. So I understand why they may be charging a service call fee, but it's important to know if there's gonna be one. So I'm gonna pause my big mouth for a few minutes and I'm gonna let you guys ask questions or at least go, good gravy, that is complicated because I hear you. OK, I've been doing it for a long time and I still have to go back and uh, read it again sometimes. So who has questions specifically about this inspection addendum? So I'm going to jump in yes, because please. I was going with it, the whole flow with it, marking and stuff. But I just want to reiterate the fact that the home inspection and the termite or the wood infestation is primary dwelling only. Yes. Um, that comes up a whole, 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 whole lot. If you want a detached garage or a storage shed added to that, you need to put it under that um, section G for the additional structures because it's not going to, you're not going to be able to ask for it. I mean, if you have them inspected and there's termites there, sorry. I mean, because it's not, it's just the, the primary dwelling. And then yes. could you go over um, on the second page, number one, um, it's the radon well septic wood infestation and flow infiltration. Basically, that's saying that the seller shall correct those. So if there is an issue with one of those, is that paragraph saying that you're going to fix that up to the limit yes. in the in paragraph 17? Basically, they're saying those inspections, we're not going to argue about whether they're valid or not. Home inspection and additional inspections can result in inspection results that can be argued. So the home inspector mentions that there's a hole in the vinyl siding where a rock flew up and knocked a hole in the vinyl siding, okay? Well, if you're the buyer, you think that's defect. If you're the seller, you think that's cosmetic. So there's gonna be some arguing back and forth about the validity of whether something is a material defect or not. This inspection addendum is saying, with number one, that radon, well septic, and wood infestation and inflow and infiltration, there is no argument. That report is gold. If there are termites, there are termites. If there is non-potable water or E. coli in the water, there is E. coli in the water, okay? We're not going to argue those. The seller has no option except to accept that those reports are valid and that the repairs will fall onto clause 17, which is the seller's, you know, the seller's obligations are either correct the problems with the radon, well, septic, wood infestation, and influent infiltration, or credit the repair remediation limit. We're not going to even discuss the validity of whether they're material defects or not. Whereas home and additional inspections, eh, maybe, maybe they're defects, maybe they're not. On a brick house, the brick windowsill on the exterior is maybe level and not slanted slightly downward to help with rainfall to shelf off of that. Is that cosmetic? Is that a defect? The, this is why I can't ever get off the phone, y'all, because nobody knows. It depends. And my first question to you was always going to be, are you representing the seller? Or are you representing the buyer? Because those are up for debate. And that's what is so fascinating about our industry is that today I'm seeing it from the buyer's point of view, but tomorrow I'm seeing it from the seller's point of view. And items that are a result of inspections are um, very, very easily construed one way or the other, depending on which side of the transaction you're sitting on. Cosmetic then, versus defect is hard. Did that answer your question though, Jennifer? Yes, yes, it did. And then one other thing that we get calls about a lot are the wood infestation uh, reports. And when old evidence is found, whether it's termites or what have you, um, when old evidence is found and they are still recommending treatment. So no active, no live bugs, nothing like that. It was just old evidence. Do they still have to treat for that? That's hard. I say you have to look at that inspection report because there is a mark there on the inspection report, whether they are indicating treatment or not indicating treatment. 
And if they're indicating treatment, yep. you're doing treatment. Yep, that is correct. Now, the seller doesn't have to use that exterminating company. They can shop around and find a different exterminating company. But I will tell you to be very careful. Um, I, I know of a situation where the house went back on the market because it fell apart due to repairs. The seller found a termite inspector who would say, nah, I don't see any. But that first report existed. The listing agent had knowledge of that first report. That listing agent can't go, okay, well, I guess we didn't have termites. No, the listing agent is going to have to disclose that to all potential buyers. Otherwise, they could be seen as hiding evidence of termites, okay? So just be very careful with that. Call me. Again, call me. Call me if you have anything weird. Um, because I, believe me, I've seen plenty of weird. I can, I can give, you, give you advice. All right, anything else? This one was like, I felt like I should have had an extra cup of coffee for this one. All right, one more for me then, since nobody else has taken up. So the inflow and infiltration inspection, just a little piece of advice there. Make that appointment early mm -hmm. because they are so backed up that you literally are right before closing sometimes getting that inspection done if you're on the selling side. And I had a major boo-boo with my last one. And I missed my appointment by five minutes and they were gone. So we had to reschedule and it was literally the day before closing. So schedule that as early as you can. Don't wait um, because there is a backlog. There's only so many of those folks um, in that department that can get out and do these inspections. And as you know, everything's been hopping. So they've been extremely busy. So order that early if you can. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Right. Anybody so have actually, anything? I got I please, got a question for you. Please, Carla. So on one that closed for me yesterday, I represented the buyer. We did the home inspection and negotiated, you know, sent in our removal of contingency on repair things that we wanted, right? Right. They, they offered up the remediation limit, but what we ultimately wanted was the repairs, okay? So we, we I negotiated for John to help us out got the sellers agree